Yeah. All right. Good evening, Dr. Lily, Dr. Lee Su Yuan. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. And I thank you very much for your availability in, uh, in our journal club. So this is basically a journal club for interests in hand surgery area. And uh, if you look into the number of groups, it's about, Elisa, do you remember what's our number? It's about a hundred and, no, no, about 90s, 90s people. But as you know, we pick Friday evening for our regular meeting, but then people have their business here and there. So that's why those who are joining us is not really that uh, big number from week to week. But hopefully it's going to be good to have you this evening as you would like to share something that is not quite common in our practice, but it's going to be great for us to, to, to know the pathology so that we are able to manage the problem by knowing broader from, rather than knowing of our daily cases in our daily practice. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Lily to share her knowledge and also what youth experiences with the nerve problem. So Lily, you may start your presentations. Thank you. And uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. It's nice. Okay. okay uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very glad to have this chance. And uh, I'm very grateful also um, to have invitation from Dr. Teddy. And today I'm going to talk about Parsonage Turner syndrome, which is a relatively rare nerve condition in for hand surgery. And I'm Dr. Xu Yuan Li, and I'm from China. And my hospital is Ningbo Number no. Six Hospital, and our hand hand surgery department was relatively big, and we have uh, actually close to sixty excellent hand surgeons in my department. And our department now start to divide into two uh, subgroup, and my group is doing more nerve. And the other group, they, they are doing joints in arthroscopy. And the third group, they are doing um, trauma and micro and uh, most of the perforator flaps. So um, nerve uh, right now was um, the most interesting thing for me. And today I will present the Parsonage Turner syndrome, which is, is very, very interesting. And today we are going to focus on the diagnosis and differentiation. Actually, Parsonage Turner syndrome was first described in 1887, but it got its name in 1949 when Parsonage Turner and when Parsonage and Turner they described a large series of cases and we call this symptom PTS. At that time people think it's a very rare disease and and this disease presents with um, neuralgic amyotrophy which means um, an acute pain and followed by weakness and muscle atrophy. And of course at that time people think uh, the the incidence is very low, which is two to three per 100,000 people. And male is more than female. And actually, except for the Parsonage Turner syndrome, this nerve condition also have many other names, such as 
brachial plexus neuritis and neuralgic amyotrophy and passenger Turner syndrome. Now we can divide this nerve condition into two group. One is the idiopathic group and the other group is he hereditary group. In 1949, when Parsonage and Turner report those cases, those cases were mainly involved the shoulder girdle muscle. You can see very severe muscle atrophy um, over the involved uh, muscle. But we um, now we find there are more and more other types of the Parsonage Turner syndrome, which include sometimes only radial nerve, the PIN, the AIN, and so on. Any part of the brachial plexus can be involved. Although the etiology of this disease is still unknown, but there are many relative factors, such as infection, such as surgery, any anesthesia, and some patients just complain of uh, the, the symptom appear after a stressful exercise. Common involved in nerves, uh, including the upper trunk or the lower trunk or any other nerves of the brachial plexus. But it's different for a neurologist and a hand surgeon because, because for a neurologist, they will see more patients involve the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, such as the suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, muscular cutaneous nerve, lung thoracic nerve. But for hand surgeon, we will see more patients involved the posterior interosseous nerve, AIN, spinal accessory nerve, ulnar, radial, and median nerve. Today we are going to focus our topic on the idiopathic neurologic amyotrophy. While the clinical diagnosis criteria for this disease, including acute onset, sometimes might be subacute, and initial pain with numerical rating scale, usually this pain will last for 10 days to, to 20 days. And multifocal distribution mainly in the upper brachial plexus, this because this criteria was made by the neurologist, not by hand surgeon. Monophasic causes with slow recovery, which means um, when the disease starts, it's getting worse and worse. Well, to make end diagnosis, you have to exclude all the other conditions, such as preceding trauma, malignancy, diabetes, myelitis, and sometimes other kind of injury. To update the Parsonage Turner syndrome, because uh, 100 years passed since people described this disease. Unfortunately, the etiology is still unclear, especially for the idiopathic neurology, neurologic atrophy. While the incidence rate, um, previously we think it is very, very rare, um, but in fact, in fact, the incidence is five-fold more common than previously thought. I think this is the improvement. And we find that the result is poorer, the outcome is poorer than previously reported. Fortunately, we, we now can make an early diagnosis by sonograph or by MRI examination. The differentiation is very difficult because we have many, many um, similar conditions which can present with the same clinical presentations such as cervical and shoulder pain and numbness tingling 
and uh, upper limb fatigue with muscle, muscle atrophy and paresthesia. Those nerve conditions, including cervical radiculopathy, nerve compression, periphery neuropathy, HNPP, and many other conditions. First, cervical radiculopathy, we know it's very common disease in our clinic and in orthopedics clinic, especially for the spine surgeon. They share the same clinical presentations such as pain in the cervical spine, shoulder, and upper extremity. But the onset usually insidious, not like the passenger Turner syndrome, which is acute. And the symptoms caused by the CR always exaggerated by neck movements. In patients that do not respond to conventional therapy and have a progressing of upper extremity muscle weakness or atrophy, you should aware of the passage Turner syndrome. Hirayama disease, which uh, always involve juvenile group uh, from start from 15 to 30 years old, men were common than women. And this disease was commonly seen for Asian people with asymmetrical forearm muscle atrophy and weakness. Generally, there's no sensory disturbance. The lesion was confined to an anterior horn valve cells of the lower cervical spine, spinal cord. Yes. Nerve compression symptoms such as thoracic outlet syndrome will involve the lower trunk, including the median nerve and the ulnar nerve, and will cause numbness and tingling and intrinsic muscle atrophy. And for those kind of patients, we will take a look at the x-ray. And some of them, we will find out uh, cervical rib, which is abnormal. And uh, sometimes the compression is come from the scaling muscle, including the anterior scaling, the middle scaling, and the tiny scaling, scaling muscle. Other conditions like nerve compression, uh, such as carpal tunnel syndrome and cubital tun tunnel syndrome, I think um, this is very familiar. Uh, plastic surgeons because carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, the incidence is, um, is more than 55% of the population. And also when a carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital tunnel syndrome, the symptom comes very acute. We should aware of the personage Turner syndrome as well because these two nerve conditions can happen combined together. And we already uh, encountered such kind of cases. And if we just take, uh, take it for granted that this is just a carpal syndrome and we just performed a carpal release, and sometimes the symptom will not relieve after surgery. At that time, you might think there might be other nerve conditions as well. HNPP is a very rare nerve condition, which is a autosomal dominant genetic disease. Most of those cases will occur between seven to 30 years old. And this symptom might be re recurrent very frequently during his life, uh, during his whole life. And uh, fortunately, the prognosis of this disease is very good. Usually, it will, um, it will recover within three months with very good conservative treatment. And for this kind of disease, usually there's no pain. So that's the difference between 
That's the difference from the Parsonage Turner syndrome. For hereditary NA, um, it's also a genetic disease. This type is really, really rare, and you cannot miss it because patients usually have special facial features such as eye distance narrow, uh, sometimes Mongolia fold, small mouth, um, and so on. Unfortunately, this kind of nerve condition have a very bad prognosis. Patient will, um, will finally get some dysfunction after the onset. Well, um, auxiliary examination for Parsonage Turner syndrome, including the EMG, the MRI, the ultrasound. Uh, the EMG is very helpful for those cases uh, with ner nerve damage. But for the very early stage of the disease, such as less than three weeks disease, the EMG cannot show, cannot give us the evidence because we have to wait until three weeks to get an accurate diagnosis by the EMG. But the MRI and ultrasound, on the other hand, can help, help us a lot for early diagnosis. MRI can show, um, especially for the brachial plexus, the nerve roots, the morphological changes. Usually, we will find some swelling and uh, sometimes T2 signal intensity of the involved nerves, sometimes the upper trunk, sometimes for the suprascapular nerve. Um, and, and I have to say, ultrasound is more uh, convenient, more cheap, and it's very good tool for us to diagnose, especially for those distal nerves, like radial nerve, median nerve, and uh, ulnar nerve it can give us a direct morphological image for the, ex, uh, for, the, for, the, for the nerve. It's like we perform an x-ray for the nerve by the ultrasound. We can see many changes, and we're going to talk this uh, in the next slide. Actually, we have, two, we have four types of sonographic abnormalities. Uh, which we describe it in the INA, which is idiopathic neuralgic atrophy. First, we can find out swelling without constriction. And we can find swelling with incomplete constriction, or swelling with complete constriction, or rotationary phenomenon over the nerve. When the nerve um, have a complete constriction, we also call this phenomenon hourglass change. Uh, we can show this change in, in, uh, in other slides. And I'm going to talk about several of my clinical case and how we diagnose it, how we treat it. This is our first case, which is a uh, 53 years old male patient who is a carpenter. He presents to me with left upper limb pain for two months and weakness for two weeks. Two months ago, um, patient complaint of sharp pain appeared in left, in left upper arm and forearm. And and after the pain, patient feel weakness and the muscle atrophy happened very soon. We can see from this picture, patient cannot make an extension of the wrist and finger. And we can see very obvious muscle atrophy over the forearm. Lily, would you, would you slide show? You're out of slideshow. Um, yeah, the play button on top. Right. 
Yeah. Okay. I okay. think I can do this. Okay. Yes, from this picture, we can see uh, patient also have, um, have the ulnar nerve injury and patient complain of numbness, tingling of the ring and small finger. And we can see a little, a little bit of intrinsic muscle atrophy. And we also checked the upper trunk, the elbow strength and the shoulder strength. We, uh, we can find a little bit, a li just a little bit um, weakness over the shoulder and elbow. And the grip strength is very weak. The EMG showed the whole brachial plexus were involved with the radial nerve completely injured and ulnar nerve um, heavily injured, which is partially. And this is our ultrasound image for the radial nerve. We can see the, the cross section area and we compared the we compared the um, contralateral, we compared um, the injured side with the contralateral side, we can see the cross section area change, which is very swelling. The area is relatively bigger than the contralateral side. Longitudinally, we find three points of our glass change. And for the ulnar, we also checked by ultrasound, but we only find the swelling change. There's no um, obvious constriction or obvious hourglass change. So, so we leave the ulnar. We didn't uh, do anything for the ulnar except conservative treatment, but we performed a nerve exploration for the radial nerve, and. Uh, we find three points of our glass change, just like the ultrasound showed us, which is very correct, very accurate. And, and we think, and besides the our glass change, we also find the nerve, the whole nerve changed. It's like a glass change. Mm. So we, we dissect the lesion, the nerve lesion, and we performed um, neurolysis, and as well as the nerve graft. Unfortunately, for this case, we followed up for one year, and the the outcome is not satisfactory. We can see the ulnar nerve. There's no recovery at all with with very obvious intrinsic muscle atrophy and the numbness still. And the radial nerve only partially recovered with the wrist extension. Uh, when we recommend the patient to perform the second, case, second phase of the surgery because we, we want to do the tendon transfer for him and he just refused because he already get used of this condition and he can, he, he already went back his job for a carpenter. And this is hard, um, hardly to explain. This is our second case, uh, very interesting also. A patient complained right shoulder abduction weakness and muscle atrophy for the whole year. For the whole year, he um, visited spine surgeon and neurologist and hand surgeon at last. And one of our hand surgeon also think he might be, uh, this might be a, outlet, this might be a TOS, which is thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, but when we check out the history, patient had, has a history of acute neck and shoulder pain for 10 days before 
before he developed the weakness and the muscle atrophy. EMG showed severe injury of the suprascapular nerve as well as the axillary nerve. And because it's been one year, we have no other treatment. We have to explore the whole brachioplexus and we performed the brachioplexus neurolysis for this patient. Fortunately, three months later, we, we have seen the improvement of the range of motion for the shoulder. And we can see also the muscles coming back. Five months later, patient gained full range of motion for the shoulder. The third case is also very interesting. The patient complained um, finger job for four weeks and she is a new mother. She had a four month baby and she also complained extremely pain uh, before, before his weakness of the extension. Um, because patient come to see us very early, only four weeks. So we still uh, have our hope that she can recover by him, by herself, um, because we are giving her our conservative treatment. But the conservative treatment didn't show any improvement in two weeks. So we checked his radio nerve and we find out there are constriction and there are also very constriction which might be our glass change so we decide not to wait longer and we performed the nerve exploration and we find out there are actually two two points of our glass change because the first case gave us a lesson that nerve graft was not so, uh, the result of the nerve graft is, uh, is not so satisfactory. So this time we didn't do a nerve graft. We just resect the, ner the nerve lesion site and we repaired it directly. We have two sites and the other constriction we just we just performed a release. Three months later, patient got a quick recovery for the finger extension. And, and in four months, she gained full range of motion for one to five fingers. And this is the last patient. Um, I want to say that at the very early stage, which means within one month for the onset, if you didn't find any constriction, if you didn't find any sign of hourglass change, you can just perform the conservative treatment. For many of our patients, will get improvement um, in very short period. For this patient, he showed up in our clinic, um, complained of the weakness of his shoulder abduction for one month. And we checked the MRI and we see only a little bit swelling over the plexus. So we performed the only the conservative treatment, which including um, steroid treatment and uh, um, sometimes we also give him some of our traditional herbs. And uh, you have to check any any reason for this. Sometimes a uh, patient got this symptom after a flu. So you might have to use some antivirus treatment. 
uh, for this patient, uh, only one month after our treatment, patient gained his full range of motion of the shoulder. And actually, we have many, many uh, such cases, uh, including the including the radial nerve palsy, and uh, many of them gained very good results um, only by conservative treatment. I think the most important thing is to exclude any condition, any nerve condition that you should or you have to perform, perform a neuralysis or surgery for him, um, especially when the nerve morphology changed such as the constriction or hourglass change and so on. And uh, except this condition you have, you can just wait because um, seven to 80% of this patient will recover by itself in six months or sometimes in three years. Um, I think that's all for today and thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very nice. And um, I think you share quite, quite various in terms of different outcome with quite difficult diagnosis if we are not really aware about the disease or about the problem. So Lily, you may stop share your slide. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will try. Yeah, the red button on top, if you could detect, stop share. On top, the red button. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I found it. Right. Okay. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, just to let you know that Dr. Su Yuan Li had her fellowship in Kleinert Institute. Was that Lily? Yes. Right, guess it was for two years. Oh, for me only one year. One year, right. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's uh, a privilege to get a chance to have the fellowship at a very, very famous institute in hand surgery and and Dr. Lily is actually spending time in the United States so that we are very grateful to have her English, which for many got quite some problems with the new people from China to speak in English. So you speak very well so that it's very clear. And you also speak quite slow so that people could uh, follow and join your explanation. Thank you, because we, I think today we have plenty of time, so I try to slow down. Yeah, yeah, I asked you for, to do that, that's good. Yeah, All right, so. My previous slides was, was very, very big, and we have many, many cases inside, but I think, uh, and I, I'm not sure we have how, how many times we have, so, mm -hmm. um, so, so I can slope down and I think it's, it's better. Yeah, yeah, much better. All right, so if any of you, friends, colleagues, who have questions, you may just let me know so that uh, you may activate the raise hand button or you may type if you don't like to, Direct, yeah, we have Dr. here, her. yes, Dr. Eliza? Yeah. Oh, you Dr. Do you Teddy, to yeah. Something? Yes, yes, okay. So, Lily, Dr. Nyoman is from yeah. Bali. Hi. Hi, Dr. Lily, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the great presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I just want to ask you one question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you resect the nerve, mm -hmm. yeah, when you find the hourglass uh, uh, 
deformity on the nerve and mm -hmm. you resect it, yeah, and without graph, how you mobilize the nerve, whether you mobilize proximally and distally or you change the, the track of the nerve or just, just directly uh, suturing it, repairing it. You know, uh, because we are talking about the radial nerve, because um, that case it's a radial nerve, and uh, when you when you explore the radial nerve, especially when your elbow is flexed, it's really like very loose. Oh, mm. very loose. Yeah, we have plenty of we have plenty of the you know. We can just because we resect two segments. And we can still make the repair um, without tension. Uh, but of course, we need an immobilization of the air. Yeah. 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 At least uh, four, four weeks. Four weeks, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. And any other uh, electrophysiologic treatment that you give to the patient? Uh, nerve stimulation like that after surgery? Of course, of course, stimulation, yeah. Uh, so because it, it's a, a full transaction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lily. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nyoman. Yeah, yeah. Well, Lily, if I am not mistaken, when you describe about the uh, excisions of that hourglass, deformity with quite certain length, you mentioned that you perform grafting. And in fact, in your explanations, responding to Dr. Nyoman's questions, it's a direct coaptation. It's not with, it's without graft. Which one is correct? I may be wrong in taking your explanations at your presentations, during your presentations. You know, um... That's different way we treat the our glass, our glass change. We, um, according to the literature, there are many many ways you can treat it. There are many authors still prefer doing the nerve graft, mm -hmm. and uh, there are authors uh, they will prefer not doing anything, just neurolysis. Mm -hmm. Even even the our glass happened. And and uh, of course there are there are more doctors that they will prefer doing the direct direct dissection and direct repair. Right. So in the hourglass, in some of the uh, slides that you presented, the hourglass came like in a two friction. In that case, you do not need to spare the cable or the cable or the nerve in between the two constriction. You just excise it in, in proximal and the distal part of the two constriction. For the first case, we dissect five centimeters. Right. Dissect all the nerve lesion, including a, a little part of like normal part. So, it's too short, we can make a direct repair. So we have to do the nerve graft. I see. All right, yeah. so Elisa, do you want to ask something? Dr. Elisa? Yes, doctor, hello. Um, I'm actually gonna ask uh, something about a very basic questions that uh, how to divine actually the diagnosis uh, between the history from the patient that uh, if the patient, it is actually PTS is a subacute or acute onset. So how do we know that it is uh, the brachial plexus injury is actually a PTS from the pain or the severity of the pain? Because I read that uh, most of it, they have the initial pain that greater than uh, fast uh, seven or something like that, yes. So you want yes. to differentiate from the brachial plexus injury and the Turner syndrome, am I right? 
Yes, exactly. So I'm just to make sure that uh, if the brachial plexus injury is actually a PTS, so how do we differentiate? So we uh, we're not uh, gonna make the patients any longer uh, and get a um, uh, uh, and the uh, we misdiagnose with the patient. I think brachial plexus injury always caused by um, when very obvious trauma, very heavy trauma, very, you know, it's like a, but Parsonage Turner syndrome is just like, you wake up with an extremely pain. There's nothing happened. Sometimes they complain that I, I got a flu before this symptom. And sometimes they, they, they said, I just did some like physical, physical exercise and nothing more. So injury, uh, there's no very, very severe injury for the Parsonage Turner syndrome. And for the brachial plexus injury, there's always a very severe injury like motorcycle, like motorcycle uh, crash something like that very dramatically or sometimes with um shoulder dislocation yeah i think relatively easy right thank you thank you very much it's a very great explanation thank you you're welcome okay thank you we have we have a cat want to sing a song no sorry <laughs> <laughs> Well, we Sorry, doctor. <laughs> That's a problem. Not problem. We have a question from Dr. Sweety Pribadi. Will surgery, the neurolysis, still be helpful in patient after years of onset, being in the chronic stage? Yes, actually, recently, more and more literatures agree that surgery plays a great role in treating Parsonage Turner syndrome. Because uh, in many neurologist points of view, this kind of disease should belong to them because conservative treatment, they think conservative treatment is enough for Parsonage Turner syndrome. But actually we see many patients with very poor outcome. So now hand surgeons and neurosurgeons are playing a uh, more important role in treating this kind of nerve condition. And even for the chronic, uh, chronic, chronic cases, yes. I think the Parsonage Turner syndrome sometimes combine with the nerve compression because the first stage is the nerve swelling. When nerve is swelling and the compression became severe. So it's, it became a relatively compression caused by nerve swelling. So when we are doing neurolysis, we are still helping the situation. So this can explain my second case. My second case with an upper trunk, with an upper trunk uh, lesion. A patient, patient have a one year, one year course for the symptom. And we performed a very simple neurolysis over the supraclavicular level and patient got a very good outcome, yeah. So um, I will recommend surgery for those patients who cannot, uh, who have no improvement in six weeks you have you don't have to wait more you have you don't have to wait longer than 6 weeks when the 6 weeks no improve you can do the surgery right so a lesion kind i mean lesion kind uh, sorry kind of lesions a uh, like hourglass appearance happens in the peripheral nerve what about the potential or the uh, pathology that may 
take place in the brachial plexus, meaning that the, the upper part, not in the peripheral part. Have you ever seen that? You mean the hourglass uh, change happens uh, over the brachial plexus right. root? Yes. No such, no such uh, cases, actually. Um, hourglass were more commonly seen in the most commonly seen in the PIN, post interosseous nerve, and sometimes radial nerve, sometimes AIN, anterior interosseous nerve, and sometimes suprascapular nerve and muscular cutaneous nerve. But there's no uh, like C, C5, C6, C7, no. There's no like upper trunk hourglass change, no. Okay. Yeah, All right. So, to the literature. Right. So in the pathology of the hourglass, whether the constriction part comes from fibrotic tissue or it's merely just because of the uh, greater part comes as swollen cable. That's very difficult to answer you because I think it's still unknown the 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 me no I, I cannot answer you this question. I think swelling is the first stage and something something happens it's like a twisting or with the uh, range of motion when you're doing a lot of uh, range of motion, the radial nerve was twisted you know. Yeah. And kind of just guess. It's a guess. It's not like mm, somebody already know how it happened. Right, right. Okay. And you mentioned also that in this area of INA, there are hereditary cases and also cases that comes from idiopathic root. So with the hereditary cases, have you got some, you know, pedigree or family history that you could track? Yes, yes, yes. You, um, yes, you can find a family history. Yes. And, uh, you know, the patients show to you, they are very young. Sometimes they're children. Mm -hmm. So, and they have like their face features, totally different than than the normal person and it's really really rare condition and i think you you might not like confuse yourself because they are totally different the heretical hereditary and the idiopathic they're totally different and the, the hereditary type is really really rare so just to make sure that this pts is mostly idiopathic and mm -hmm. yeah, 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 come yeah. From hereditary problem, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the incidence rate is actually one person per one thousand. So it's not right. actually rare. It's not rare because um, in three years in my clinic, I have seen four, more than forty cases. Right. More than forty cases. Forty. So, yeah. Wow. yeah, it's surprisingly high. Okay. Have you met your publications with this PTS? I am writing. I'm still oh, writing. <laughs> you still owe me to write papers on the use of the tumor cell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to uh, 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 apply, um, apply a project. Yeah, I'm doing this. Right. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Just for you to know, friends, that the group in Ningbo, and especially with the uh, subgroup led by Dr. Lili, applies the uh, Tumasen injections for some type of uh, her surgery. And she did also quite numbers of uh, congenital anomaly cases without tourniquet as well. And she performed the uh, brachial plexus work also with these uh, tumescent injections. 
And how do you find it so far? Did you encounter any like, you know, big obstacles with your Thomasin technique? No, there's no complication at all. Great. So yeah. at the beginning, I remember you showed case like, you know, with bluish, a blue like fingers after the uh, surgery, but it reveals without anything, without any intervention. Yeah, it's just temporarily, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Well, it's great that you, sh you, you shared a quite nice area, I mean, disease that we are not really familiar with this sharing. We have to be more aware in knowing the problem that PTS is something that needs quite prompt recognition and also prompt action as you suggested like you know not more than four weeks or maybe six weeks yeah. six right weeks. six mm -hmm. weeks yeah six weeks to start considering the uh, interventions with the neurolysis or maybe with mm -hmm. the uh, yeah what do you call like section depending on yeah depending on your examination yeah right your sound is one of the uh, good armamentarium for the diagnosis and also the MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in regards of EMG, it still has place to send the patients of with course, EMG. Of right. course, yeah. And the passenger Turner syndrome and is very special because if if other nerve conditions, the muscle atrophy will not will not show up so quickly. Right. And the EMG will show like in three weeks, after three weeks, it will show the nerve axonal damage. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, that's the point for EMG. But before three weeks, that's difficult for EMG to make an egg diagnosis. Uh -huh. But we can use the ultrasound and the MRI. Oh, that's a good. Uh, that's a good message. All right. Yeah, very important to recognize that. Okay. So, friends, we are really grateful to have Dr. Li Su Yuan to share with us this Parsonage Turner syndrome, which is good for us to learn, and hopefully that you would not miss the case in making proper diagnosis. If you do not really do it by yourself, then you do also uh, make good, make a good referral of the patient so that the patient wouldn't get like, you know, quite late intervention. And even, you know, the poorer thing or poor for the patient if the assessment comes very late. And I believe orthopedic surgeon also in our country may not really aware about this uh, PTS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and less chance you know, to have our colleague general surgeons to have the ability to recognize the problem. So plastic surgeons may also got a referral with hand weakness, started yeah. with you know, yeah, very notorious That's history. We all performed the carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, recently, I have many cubital tunnel syndrome and I make a diagnosis with cubital tunnel syndrome. But when, or when I'm doing surgery, I surprisingly find out the nerve swelling were in, a, were in a very long segment. And right. I think that might be kind of, you know, neuritis also. Right. And in this condition, you have to talk to your patient that the surgery might not solve all the problem because you have other conditions. Right, right. Thank you. The last point also very important to recognize. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big applause to Dr. Li Tzu Yuan. And um, here's Lily. We are really grateful and thank you very much. Thank By you. the way, I like the uh, the door. 
the Is door behind you. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's nice wooden material. You know, nice wooden uh, door. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a door. Okay, friends. Let's meet up again next week, and hopefully that if Doctor Lily got energy in her late evening, you are welcome to also join our journal club, Lily. And I got also kind of like you know what do you call? Just send me the link, okay? Right. We got also quite senior hand surgeon from Dublin in Ireland. In Ireland, uh, really would like to mingle with the uh, Indonesian hand surgeon peers, but I still yeah, found out that, you know, maybe quite need some time for us to be quite bigger in terms of a group who are keen to join the journal club. With a small number, you know, you people from abroad join us, then may not be like excited in, in, in sharing ideas and opinions and also the uh, knowledge, but, yeah, it's a good start to have you with us this evening. Thank you very much, Lily. Thank you. And see you thank again. Thank you very much, Lily. See you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Teddy. Thank you, Arianto. And everyone, thanks a lot. And have a good, have a good night. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Goodbye. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Teddy. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Bye. Dr. Lily. Okay. Goodbye.